Let us enter into this time of worship and celebration. In the safety of this sacred place, we are invited into a time of gratitude, reflection, renewal, and hope. Come in, bringing all of who you are. Calm your hurried pace. For this hour, let the cares, the fretfulness, and worry be set aside. Know that you are not alone. There is strength and caring support for you here. Let us quietly reflect on these words. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this time of worship and celebration of life here at Westminster Church. There are a number of announcements today, and I'm going to begin by inviting Jeannie to come to, come to the pulpit. Um, there is a new fun script at the back. It is due on um, March 13th. And because of the timing of Easter and when the next fun script will be out, if you are going to order anything for Easter gifts, I would suggest you order it on this one so that you have them in time because the next one won't be due till just before Easter. Um, there also is a form at the back for the Easter memorial flowers that we've done. We haven't been able to do them for the last couple of years, but we um, have them again. And they are going to be due on April 3rd. It's a yellow form at the back that you can reach. We are going to be making some meat beef pies this week, so if you um, want some of those, be ready for next uh, Sunday. They'll be ready, and if you know how many you want, let me know ahead of time and I'll have them ready for you um, next Sunday upstairs. Um, the last, well not the last few years because we haven't been here, but before that, during Lent, we always had Iris House as our special charity. And we're going to do that again this year. Rose has put um, the items in the, um, in the bulletin that Iris House would like. There's a big red basket at the back. And if you could just put those items in there, that would be great. And we'll deliver them after Easter. And we do have a couple of birthdays today. And I'd like to sing happy birthday separately to them. The first one is um, Jamie's birthday. He's one of our Sunday school children. Gene Clark's great-grandson, so he's going to be nine if we can sing happy birthday to Jamie. And hopefully we'll be able to have those Sunday school children back with us soon. And finally today, Val Drabok is celebrating her birthday, and I, I'm not going to tell you how old she is. I think she stopped counting a while ago, so we'll just sing happy birthday to her. I'm, <clears throat> I have just a couple of announcements to add to that. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday we will be on Daylight Savings Time. So uh, turn your clocks ahead. May 13th. So uh, March, 13th. March 13th, May 13th. <laughs> I knew it started with an M. March 13th. And one other announcement. You may have heard uh, that the United Church uh, was encouraging its members, if they're interested in humanitarian relief, uh, to donate to the Canadian Red Cross. The Government of Canada would match that up to dollar for dollar, up to $10 million. CBC carried uh, a news article this past week. That has been met. The $10 million has been given. It has been matched by the government. So if you wish to donate, uh, the United Church uh, has a form. This will not be matched, as, as I understand it. But uh, the United Church does have a form online. You can also donate by check. And I have, the invita I have the details of that here. And I will leave it at the back of the church. So if you're interested in donating to humanitarian relief for the Ukrainian situation, uh, I, I'll leave this for you to look over. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Are there any further announcements? Bonnie, can you come up to the front, please? The Zoom people can't hear you. On behalf of Jamie's family and Jamie, he wanted me to say thank you for singing to him. He really does appreciate it. Thank you, Bonnie. We spoke a moment ago about the situation in the Ukraine. I would invite you now, if you are able, to please stand for a moment of silence as we remember 
the suffering of the people in the Ukraine. As we remain standing, let us pray. God, compassionate one, we pray for those in danger today, for all who know oppression, injustice, or fear, whose land is being invaded, or whose home is unsafe. May they be sheltered in love. May they have courage and hope and be enfolded in grace. May their wounds and trauma be healed. May the strength of the earth be theirs, the freedom of the sky, the peace of the trees. We hold in our hearts all who are afraid. May they bear our love in theirs, for we are one. May the spirit of life hold us together as one humanity, one world, one body, one hope. May the spirit of peace change the hearts of those who misuse power, and may the same spirit be with us all. Amen. Please be seated. And now let us take a moment to reflect on the words of Westminster United Church's mission statement. Westminster United Church is an inclusive church for progressive Christians creating something beautiful for God. Our entry into worship and celebration this morning is a responsive one. The words have been printed in this morning's bulletin. I invite you to please join with me. After he was baptized by John, Jesus went by himself to the wilderness where he was tempted. Forty days in the desert, Jesus was tempted to become spectacular and powerful. Today we begin our journey with Jesus through the season of Lent, which brings us to face some of our own weaknesses and temptations. Let us worship God and walk the journey together, seeking the living spirit of Jesus as our guide and companion along the way. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Lent is a time when we reflect on our personal faith journeys. Some people spend extra time in prayer and Bible study during Lent. Some people fast. Some people with unnecessary luxuries try to live more simply. Some people set aside money for the poor and needy. All these are worthy pursuits. But the worthiest pursuit is our desire to draw closer to God and to understand what it really means to be a follower and disciple of Jesus. So let us together enter into the disciplines of Lent, and in our journeying together, may we become one more, may we become more what Jesus intended when he calls us his own. Let us come together in prayer. God, Spirit of life, during this Lenten season, help us to journey into a new awareness of the divine presence in our lives. Save us from our own temptations so that we may more freely follow the way of Jesus. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, I have chosen various meditations for us to reflect on. This morning, it's a poem by Carrie Wellander. It's in the book, A World of Blessings. It's a Lenten poem with the title, For Waiting in the Wilderness. This is the wilderness time when every path is obscure and thorns have grown around the words of hope. Be the wings of our strength, O God, in this time of wilderness waiting. This is a time of stone, not bread, when even the sunrise feels uncertain and everything tastes of bitterness. 
Be the wings of our strength, O God, in this time of wilderness waiting. This is the time of ashes and dust, when, the, when darkness closes our dreams and no star shines a guiding light. But the wings of our strength, O God, be the wings of our strength, O God, in this time of wilderness waiting. This is a time of treading life, waiting for the swells to subside and for the chaos to clear. Be the wings of our strength, O God, in this time of wilderness waiting. This morning, we have a litany for Lent. It is a responsive one printed in uh, your bulletin. I invite you to please join with me. O sustainer and giver of life, free your people from the temptations of power, from the urge to control rather than enable. Come, spirit of love, liberate us from the forces of domination. O oh, living in power, er, help us to challenge abuse of authority wherever it is to be found, including in ourselves. Come, Spirit of life, give us strength not to walk by on the other side. O oh, still small voice, help the people of God to learn to listen to each other and those in authority to understand the strength that comes from true reconciliation. Come, spirit of understanding, and deepen our insights. O oh, living, loving, creativity God, help us to affirm ourselves and others, understanding that we are all uniquely created and have a voice that needs to be heard. Come, spirit of diversity, and help us see the value of difference. O oh God, who created both women and men in your image, may your church not deface its image by continuing to treat women as inferior beings. Help us to recognize and challenge discrimination based on gender, race, ethnicity, national origins, culture, sexual orientation, sexual identity, and other excuses for exclusion. Come, spirit of equality, and imbue us with the values of interconnectedness with all creation, human and non-human. Let us take a few moments to reflect on these words. May a heart of peace rest with you. And also with you. From the Hebrew Scriptures, a paraphrase of Psalm 91. God, you are our fortress, our place of safety. You are our God, and we trust you. We seek to live in your presence and stay in the shadow of the Almighty. God, spread your wings over us like a mothering hen, protecting her babies. We have nothing to fear living in faithfulness. Though circumstances become tough, illness strike us, death comes our way, whatever befalls us, we have nothing to fear. We know this because you, God, are our refuge and our sanctuary. Though temptations come to lure us from small ones to big ones, though the evil one looks like he is winning the day, we can trust you. No matter what happens in life, we can hold on to you, God, because we know you are with us, caring for us, loving us, and delivering us. God, we can call on your name anytime and anywhere, and we can believe and trust that you will answer. You alone are our refuge, our place of safety. You are our God, and we trust you. And from the New Testament, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus departed from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was guided by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was put to the test by the devil for 40 days. He ate nothing that whole time, and when it was all over, he was famished. The devil said to him, To prove your God's son, order this stone to turn into bread. Jesus responded to him, it is written, human beings are not to live on bread alone. 
Then he took Jesus up and in an instant of time showed him all the empires of the world. The devil said to him, I'll bestow on you authority all over all this and the glory that comes with it. Understand it has been handed over to me and I can give it to anybody I want. So if you will pay homage to me, it will all be yours. Jesus responded, it is written, you are to pay homage to the Lord your God and you are to revere him alone. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, to prove your God's son, jump off from here. Remember, it is written, to his heavenly messengers he will give orders about you to protect you, and with their hands they will catch you, so you won't even stub your toe on a stone. And in response, Jesus said to him, it is said, you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. So when the devil had tried every kind of test, he let him alone for the time being. And finally, a poem by Mary Oliver, Storage. When I moved from one house to another, there were many things that I had no room for. What does one do? I rented storage space and filled it. Years passed. Occasionally I went there and looked in, but nothing happened, not a single twinge of heart. As I grew older, the things I cared about grew fewer, but were more important. So one day I undid the lock and called the trash man. He took everything. I felt like the little donkey when his burden is finally lifted. Things, burn them, burn them, make a beautiful fire, more room in your heart for love, for the trees, for the birds who own nothing, the reason they can fly. Thank you, Jim, for that wonderful solo, and thank you, Jeannie, for reading, doing our readings this morning. Let us take a, a moment now to reflect on today's Lenten readings. We are called to follow Jesus of Nazareth, not counting the cost. We are called to go forward as steadfastly as he did when he journeyed towards Jerusalem and death. That kind of courage is needed as desperately today as it ever was. But let us not try to minimize the dangerous, nor deny the possibility of being led by the nose by some inferior cause or motive. The way of Jesus is the only one that matters. Only his cause is worth sticking out our neck and risking the chop. Only his mission is truly altruistic and untainted by perverse pig-headedness. Only his way will bring fruits that will bless those around us as well as keep our integrity intact and our hearts joyful. Now let us enter a few moments' silence to center our hearts and minds. And in this time of silent reflection and meditation, may our minds be open to new truth and our hearts receptive to love as we give thanks for this life we're blessed to share. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's gospel reading in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, we read and heard Jeannie read to us about the devil, about the devil testing and tempting Jesus in the wilderness and a little bit later in the city of Jerusalem. And for most of us who attend church, it's a pretty familiar story. So I'd like to take a moment now just to quickly review what Jeannie read to us from Luke's Gospel. You'll recall that the storyteller Luke tells us that Jesus is first challenge to turn stones into bread. Second, the tempter challenges Jesus to gain the wealth and the power of all the world's great empires and kingdoms, and all he has to do is bow down and pray to the tempter. And third, the devil invites Jesus to jump from the top, the very pinnacle, the very highest point of the temple in Jerusalem, but using the Hebrew scriptures as his guide and his strength, 
Jesus rebuffs the tempter and successfully resists all three of the devil's tests and temptations. This story is a parable. This story is a parable about Jesus. And this parable is one that is usually read the first Sunday of Lent. Well, what are we supposed to make of it? What does it have to say to you and to me about our own Lenten journeys, our own life's journeys? And it seems to me this parable is about three things. First, to state the obvious, it's about the temptations of Jesus. Second, it's about the temptations that you and I must face in our humanity. And third, in this parable, Jesus shows us how to interpret and make use of the scriptures. And I'm going to develop each of these three themes today. And I'll begin with the temptations of Jesus as they've been given to us in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. You'll recall that in this parable about Jesus, he was camped out in the wilderness for 40 days. And that is a reminder, the words, 40 days at least, a reminder that in the Hebrew scriptures, that Moses and the Israelites, after the escaped Egyptian bondage, wandered in the desert for 40 years. And that word 40, 40 in Bible speak, is not a specific measurement of time. The word 40, whenever you read it in the Bible, simply means a long time. Both Jesus and the ancient Israelites were in the wilderness a long time time. The gospel writer Luke goes on to tell us that Jesus ate nothing while he was in the wilderness and that he was famished. And at this point, the devil, who's probably pretending to be God, puts in an appearance and urges Jesus to turn stones into bread. Not a whole bunch of loaves of bread, but one single loaf of bread. That's important to remember. Because what the devil is doing is inviting Jesus to meet his needs and only his needs. But in the story of Moses and the Israelites, God provided enough bread, enough manna, actually more than enough to feed all the people. All the people. So in this story, the devil certainly isn't tempting Jesus to do a good thing. He isn't tempting him to feed all the people of the world. Instead, the devil is tempting Jesus to do a selfish thing, to do an individualistic thing. In other words, the devil is attempting Jesus to look out for number one and only number one. Look out for one and num- number one, the devil is saying, and let the rest of the world go to hell in a handbasket. But Jesus resists. More than that, when he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, He tells the devil that human beings do not live by bread alone. Luke, in quoting him, is reminding us that God fed hungry people in the wilderness, which is to say Jesus not only identified with those hungry people, but he had empathy for them and he embraced his own hunger. Next, the devil dangles before his eyes a vision of all the kingdoms of the world, past, present, and future. And he tells Jesus, these kingdoms have been given to me to do whatever I want with them. Now, we all know that during the time of Jesus' ministry, the most empire of them all was the Roman Empire. So the storyteller Luke is not so subtly telling his readers that imperial Rome, the current ruler of the world, is under the power of the devil, under the power of evil. Then the devil says to Jesus that he will give him all the glory and the power and the wealth of the Roman Empire and the other empires if he will fall to his knees and worship him. And again, Jesus will have none of it. Once again, he identifies with the ancient Israelites in the wilderness wanderings, and he dismisses the devil's proposal 
by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. You will worship the Lord your God, and only him will you serve. The third temptation is a religious one. Or more accurately, I suppose, it's a temptation to religious power and religious display. Remember, I'm sure you will, that in this story, the devil takes Jesus to the highest pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, and he says to him, if you're really the Son of God, take a dive from this tower. And then the devil quotes scripture, namely Psalm 91, verses 11 to 12. The devil says to Jesus, for it is written, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and they will take you up lest you might stumble your foot on a stone. In Luke's parable of the temptations and testing of Jesus, it seems that the devil really and truly believes that Jesus will try to jump from the pinnacle, the pinnacle of the temple, and that the angels really will, perhaps, save his life. But once again, for the third time, Jesus dismisses the tempter with a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12. It is said, you will not tempt the Lord your God. And at this point in the story, the devil gives up. Luke tells us that he withdrew his temptations and his testings, and he drew away for the time being. For the time being. The devil was just biding his time, as Luke tells us later in chapter 22, verse 3, when he would enter into Judas and set in motion the final phases of Jesus' life and public ministry. And although this is a fictional story, or as I read earlier, it's a parable about Jesus, it holds many truths. Or as North America's native storytellers and the late Marcus Board, a biblical New Testament scholar and historian, loved to say, I don't know if it happened this way, but I know the story is true. The first truth it reveals is that Jesus was fully human. Fully human. And like all human beings, he too was tempted. His temptations may have been the same as ours throughout his life, They may have been quite different. We just don't know. But make no mistake about it. Jesus was a flesh and blood Jewish man. He was a flesh and blood Jewish man who who knew evil's seductive allure. And yet he did not give in to it. Second, like Jesus, in our own humanity, we too are tempted. Part of life is to know evil's seductive allure. In fact, one of the primary reasons the church chose the story to be read on the first Sunday in Lent was to encourage Christians, to encourage you and me, to take a long, hard look at ourselves and the things that tempt us. What tempts you? To get started... Perhaps one of the questions might, that might be asked is this. Are you tempted by one of the world's seven deadly sins? Pride, envy, wrath, gluttony, sloth, lust, greed? Another question we may ask ourselves, am I tempted by something else? Perhaps something that looks more like the temptations and testings in this morning's scripture reading from Luke's gospel. For example, commanding stones to become bread is the temptation to make something it was never intended to be. Stones are stones. Bread is bread. Making objects out of people, especially women, especially making them sexual object, is a modern example of that. People are people, not objects. And if we objectify them in one way or another, 
We are simply dehumanizing them. Let me give you a second example. Taking power over things we do not, cannot, and should not have control of is the second temptation. We're all familiar from that, from the news this past week. Current events involving Russia's President Putin and his barbaric and brutal invasion of the Ukraine demonstrates to the whole world what happens when we submit to the seduction of the power of empire. And that is quite literally true. But on a more down-to-earth basis for the rest of us, more realistic and practical level for the rest of us, you know, much modern success is based on one's ability to get other people to do our bidding. To do our bidding. Because that way, sometimes in our own eyes, sometimes in our boss's eyes, if we get someone else to do our bidding what we want them to, we figure we look better, sometimes we feel better, and at the same time, we get everything we want. In his humanity, Jesus did not knuckle under that, to that kind of temptation. Instead, he exposed it by reminding us that we do not live by bread alone, and we are to serve only God. Anything else, Jesus says, is a waste of time. It's a waste of God's time, and it's a waste of our time. And that is something, as we go through this Lenten season, the next 40 days, that is something that should be uppermost in our hearts and minds. Now an example of the third temptation. Jesus didn't give in to the temptation of jumping from the pinnacle of the temple in order to be saved from hurt or suffering or harm. Instead, he took the journey to Jerusalem, a journey of betrayal, beating, and crucifixion. And his journey is a stark reminder to us that our personal Lenten journeys are, not, are going to be neither soft nor comfortable. In our Lenten journeys, in fact, throughout our life's journeys, we're going to face challenges and difficulties. We're going to face suffering, and we're going to face the death of loved ones. But as people of faith, in the recesses of our hearts and our minds, Perhaps when we pray, perhaps at some other time, we're reminded that Jesus endured all these things, and you and I can too. And third, it's a very important thing about this parable, especially for people who live in the 21st century in North America, Jesus shows us how to interpret and use Scripture. You remember, I'm sure, that in Luke's version of the parable of the temptations, both Jesus and the Bible, Jesus and the devil, can quote the Bible. This morning's gospel reading has the devil quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. And for something that jumps out at me, and I dare say most readers, is that the devil really knows his Bible. He really knows his Bible. And just as important, the devil interprets Scripture literally. And when it comes to showing off his biblical knowledge, as one commentator has said, he's a bit of a fundamentalist and a real windbag. The devil actually expects Jesus to jump from the top of the temple and have the heavenly angels save him. What the devil's really saying, because of his literalistic, fundamentalistic interpretation of the Bible, and because he's certain he's got it right and everybody else has it wrong, what he's saying is that the scriptures are all about yourself. Just you, me, myself, and I. The scriptures are all about self-indulgence, self-aggrandizement, self-obsession, self-centeredness. And again, Jesus will have none of it. 
He quite easily puts the tempter in his place. His interpretation and quotation from the religious history of the Israelite and the Jewish people are grounded in the great commandment to love God and to love neighbor. And because of Jesus' insight, because of his understanding of Scripture, his biblical quotations were lively and creative. They're credible and they're honest. They're humble and they're relevant. His scriptural quotations were also selective. And they were very much to the point. And most important of all, when Jesus uses scripture, he's devastatingly truthful. Or to put this another way, Jesus' three scriptural responses just don't debunk the tempter and his temptations, but they declare the good news of the gospel. In effect, by quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, he's telling the readers of Luke's gospel, yes, yes. God loves you. God loves us all. No matter what your circumstances in life might be, God is the one you can trust for food, for guidance, for care. Even when you're traveling through the wilderness of Lent and in those wilderness times in your life, every good gift is from God for which he can, we should give prayerful thanks. And that's not all. Jesus' interpretation and use of Scripture in this morning's parable declares that in every season of our lives, the God of grace is among us, that God's own child, Emmanuel, walks at your side. And that's a lesson that should not be lost on people of faith today. You see, it's not good enough to know, just know your Bible. It's not good enough to have it memorized from the first word in Genesis to the last word in the book of Revelation. Even the devil can do as much. Even the devil can quote scripture in wooden, literalistic, twisted, wrong, and windy ways. But following the example of Jesus in today's reading calls us to strive to interpret and use scripture in light of the great commandment to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. So on this first Sunday, as we begin our Lenten journey with Jesus to Jerusalem and betrayal and suffering and death, we know that that journey will not be an easy one. Never has been, never will be. But whatever should befall you, remember this, the living spirit of Jesus travels with you always. This morning's Lenten prayer as a response of one. I invite you to please join with me now as we pray together. Because temptation is woven into the fabric of our lives, and we know the weariness of 40 days in the desert, and the beckoning power of sweet fruit, and the vain promises of the world, we need you, God. Because we see the broken before the whole and the half-empty cup and the unfinished task and the thirst in freedom's quest. We need you, God. Because we trust in what we can see and we are blinded by our prejudices and we do not know what we do not know. We need you, God. Because our need for correctness exceeds our need for truth because our excuses preempt the cry of the wounded, and because our celebration of blessing is mindless of those displaced. We need you, God. Because Jesus of Nazareth walked among us, breathing his kingdom of compassion message into our sinewy souls, healing pain, suffering wounds, triumphing over all hatred, and loving us to the end. We need you, God. Please join me now as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. I wish to thank everyone who is worshiping with us on Zoom or YouTube as well as in person for their offerings which have helped us carry on our mission and ministry here at Westminster Church. This morning's offertory prayer is a responsive one. Let us pray. God of the wilderness, we give these gifts in gratitude. Rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these gifts in faith. Trusting that you will provide our needs. We give these offerings in hope. Knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and with open hands. So may it be. Amen. Throughout this Lenten season, may you live compassionate of heart, gentle in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, and generous in love. May the strength and the humble power of the creating and liberating spirit of life be with you now and always. This is Reverend Dell Stewart. I hope you enjoyed this audio presentation of today's time of worship and celebration. If you did, please click the like button. You can also click on subscribe to make it easier to find our channel and click the bell to receive a notification each time a podcast becomes available. Peace and joy now from Westminster United Church in Windsor, Ontario.